I'm joined by a former Vice President of India, Hamid Ansari. He would be speaking to us on a new book which he has written, Dare I Question, and the issues he has touched upon. Sir, firstly, thank you for making time for Beyond. And let me begin this interview uh, by asking you that you have flagged many issues in your book, but you have stressed upon the importance of secularism and plurality in Indian public life. Are these two under stress today? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. There's a lot of public debate on it. And the general perception is that the basic concepts, these are concepts which come straight out of our own constitution, are no longer being taken as taken for granted. Sir, are these under stress uh, because of the Hindutva politics, as you have mentioned in the book? Uh, where is it? Where, where it becomes okay to say that this is the Hindu worldview of politics, society, culture? Look, the point is very simple. It's a, is it an Indian view or not? India is a has many worlds within one world, and uh, those many worlds can't be done away with. They exist. They exist in terms of languages, in terms of living habits, in terms of beliefs, in terms of practices. I mean, you can keep on asking questions about India's complexity and diversity and you will be discovering new worlds all the time. Sir, you also mentioned that secularism is essential to a healthy democracy. Can you please elaborate on that? Because it was a recurring theme in your book. You see, it is, why was it? Is it there in our constitution? Why have our political leaders talked about it day in and day out? It is because if you have a multi-religious society like ours, then the relationship between the state as state and individual faiths has to be put in a certain framework. And that is what our constitution makers and political uh, leaders put it in the shape of secularism. I mean, then, mind you, the Indian secularism as it is understood and practiced in India is very different from what secularism means to somebody, say, in France. Mm -hmm. You know, their view is the state shall have nothing to do with religion. I mean, that is at least the theory. Mm -hmm. uh, in practice, it's uh, different. We took a cal calibrated, distant view the state cannot deny the faith of individuals. The state cannot prevent individual citizens from their chosen faith. But the state shall adopt a principal distance from them. But then uh, why has the word secularism in itself become uh, contested? For example, uh, there was a debate that the word was added uh, to the preamble uh, when uh, emergency uh, was in force in this country. Why has that debate on the word itself. No, don't link the two because if you go and read the co debates of the Constituent Assembly, I think the concept was there all the time. Why a particular word in a particular form was put there in 1948-49 or later is a matter of uh, a lot of uh, other complexities. But the idea was always there. It was very much the living practice of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the living practice of Jawaharlal Nehru, and all the national leaders. There was no dip, no discussion about it. There was no uh, ambiguity about it. Everybody understood the reality of Indian society and how the Indian state has to relate to different ingredients of that society. So, in your book, you have also uh, stated that Indian institutions are under stress. They are underperforming. Uh, and it has uh, led to ceding of territory by the uh, executive and judiciary has taken up that space. Can you please elaborate it and how it is impacting Indian politics in the long run? Look, in the book I have um, focused on two things. One, what are the principles and values of Indian society? And secondly, what, are the, what is the institutional structure that has been put in place? by our constitution to realize those values. So the institutions of the state, meaning the executive, uh, the, uh, no, the legislature, 
the executive and the judiciary. These are the three pillars of the state on which the policies of the state are implemented. The role of the legislature is to make laws. It is not just making laws. It is also holding the government accountable through a mechanism which is well spelt out. And last but not the least, allow public representatives to articulate and debate issues of public importance. That is what the job of the legislature is. But over time we have seen that from the 120 odd days that parliament used to meet, we are now down to about 60 or so. Which means that the time available either for making legislation or for holding government accountable or for government or for debating issues of uh, public interest and concern has got almost halved. Now one result of that which is very evident, I am not a lawyer but I do read what is uh, being written about or published. Why are so many pieces of legislation ending up in courts with the court saying this is ultra virus this or that? Simply because legislation has not been done with sufficient care. I have no doubt that those who do the drafting are competent people. Whether it is in the Ministry of Law or any other ministry, they are competent people in their own chosen field. But there is always a wider perspective. When you bring a matter for discussion in Parliament, then somebody will give you an angle from which it has not been looked at. And that is why pieces of legislation have been, not only in our parliament, in any parliament in the world, been amended, added to or subtracted from. So that is as far as the legislature is concerned. For the same reason, executive. Executive must be held responsible. I have no doubt that the individual district magistrate is doing his job. But is everybody up the line and down the line doing the job as he or she is required to do as per the structure of the laws? The answer is no. The structure and the control of the structure within the system has slackened. You read uh, reports about uh, this agency of the government or that agency of the government going off track. Why? Because the accountability system is no longer what it used to be. So the accountability of the executive to the elected representatives of the people, meaning the legislature, whether it is the state legislature or it is the uh, uh, central federal legislature, has slackened. Is it also because that a certain uh, parliamentary procedures are being bypassed, for example, standing committees? Yes, yes. I will tell you with this system, I mean the committee system, but then in 1993 I think or 92 uh, more committees were added and I recall a conversation with uh, Vajpayee Ji when he was leading Indian MPs delegation to UN, uh, I was ambassador to UN at that time and I said to him uh, that uh, you sir you have done a very good thing but there is a lacuna. So he turned in his own characteristic manner and said wo kya? And I said you have held the officers, you have asked them to appear before committees but not the ministers. And his reply was typical uh, Mr. Vajpay. He said wo aana nahi chahte hai. You know we created a structure the committees before whom senior most officers are summoned. Whether they be governor of reserve bank or secretary of a committee, they are all summoned there, but not the ministers. Why? If you look at the way the committee system works in uh, the American Congress, for example, or the British So Parliament, they should come? They should come. They should come. But Vajpayee ji in his own way summed it up and said, Wo anani jate, which is true. So let me take you to a different subject, uh, something which might be uh, closer to your heart. You are very well travelled. So liberal democracies globally, all over the world, uh, they are under challenge from authoritarian leaders, right-wing parties. Why is this happening globally, sir? 
Well, liberal democracy by definition, as there are few foundational principles of a liberal democracy, which is that the society is an open one that there is an agreement on the basic rules under which system will function. Uh, it's all there in our own constitution, for example, uh, you know, the freedom of speech, uh, freedom of movement, uh, things like that. But this is how all liberal democracies function, that you could express your views. You know, you read the foundational document of the American constitution, the Federalist. It's all there and this is how it has functioned. In England, it took a long time for a system to develop between Magna Carta and the reforms of the beginning of the uh, 20th century. It took a very long time for it to develop. We did it consciously at one go, you know, because we subscribed to it, because these were the values of our freedom struggle. There was no dispute about it. Mind you, between the time 1946 and 1949 uh, and in between was the cataclysmic period of the uh, partition, we were able to make a constitution, you know, and it is a model constitution, no question about it. There was a professor, a famous professor of political science in Cambridge University by the name of Sir Ernest Barker. He published his last book in 1954 or 55. And he put the constitution of India on the first page of that book. And then explained why he had done it. He says the preamble of the constitution of India represents all the values that I have taught in my life. That is the respect that our foundational document extracted. So it is not a document to be uh, taken lightly. It was very carefully done by people who were uh, wise, who had been, who had acquired their experience through the freedom struggle, the ups and downs of freedom struggle, and who actually subscribed to the values of their society. But so when I when I was asking you the question the right-wing leaders abroad, uh, it is parallel with the phenomena of immigration. So my question is that, is this illegal immigration making of Western, powerful Western democracies? Is it their own making? Well, history is proof over there. Look, immigration has been there for a long time. After World War II, when Germany needed manpower, it got the Turks. When the French needed manpower, when the British needed manpower, what did they do? They got them from the colonies. The West Indians came to Britain, the Algerians came to France and to other uh, West European countries. That was one phase of immigration. Then the more recent immigration. What has happened since the turn of the century? You know, Why is it that people from a well-established society like Iraq have fled because there was anarchy. You know, the life of human beings was not secure, they ran. Why did people from Africa flow? Who is responsible for the dismantling of the Libyan state? Now, this is not a matter of opinion, this is a matter of established fact because archival material is available. Government decisions are available. The Prime Minister of Britain went and said to the President of the United States, I am with you, come what may. Seven months before the formal invasion of Iraq in 2003, March, April 2003, the British government had come to know that the American decision to invade had been made. So going to Security Council was all a facade. Why was Libya bombed the way it was? For one whole month, I know it because uh, some of my younger colleagues were there at that time, they slept under the staircase. So if there is today this uh, immigration taking place from uh, different African countries to Europe, 
or from uh, West Asia to uh, Europe. It is the result of Western policies. So, in context of cultural nationalism, it also exists in India. It's part of our politics. You have argued in your book that cultural nationalism gives rise to illiberal structures yes. in politics. Is it happening in India and is lynching a case an example? Look, if you narrow this circle, then those who are within and without become identified. It was always a traditional Indian practice to make the circle as wide as possible so that nobody is left out. This was our great uh, reflective of our, our wisdom, our strength and our ethos. What cultural nationalism as it has been defined by those who propounded this approach, it narrows the circle. It tells a person, if you are born here, if you belong to this particular faith, if you uh, subscribe to this, 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 then you are a true Indian, otherwise you are an Indian on sufferance. This is the difficulty with cultural nationalism. In an Indian a society like ours, where complexity and diversity is a matter of living reality. You know, how many languages do we have? More than, uh, I think there are more than 1000 dialects. No, don't talk of dialects. The Linguistic Survey of India lists 100 languages. The constitution lists 16 languages. You take a currency note. I mean, it was my standard uh, trick in trade when I was an ambassador and I had to explain the complexity of India to a foreign audience. I would show them an Indian currency note. I said, look at it. The value is written on one side in Hindi, on the reverse in English, and then in the margin in 15, 16 other languages. These are languages, these are not scripts. These are not dialects. So you have this complexity. Look at food habits. From Punjab and Kashmir to Bengal and Assam to Tamil Nadu and Karnataka to Gujarat and Maharashtra. What is common? Is there such a thing as Indian food? Indian food can only be if all that is considered Indian. It, you cannot say that simply because I like Punjabi food and you like, uh, you know, Bengali food. But the curry be, is common. Huh? The curry is common. No, the curry is not common. Oh, please ask any, any housewife and she will tell you no. Every house, every kitchen has got a different recipe. Curry is a generic word invented by our British uh, colonial masters because they couldn't think of anything better. Are you saying that Indian cultural nationalism as propounded excludes minorities? That is the impression and that is the, not only is it impression on the recipients, it is the impression on the part of those who are wanting to implement it. So you have seen a different world before uh, you were sworn in as the Vice President of the Republic. Uh, there is also called cultural diplomacy now. And the cultural diplomacy links the world with India's ancient past. But it leaves the medieval India. Why? Look, all of our past, and it's a long, long past, is Indian experience. Go and read, uh, uh, I mean, look at the man like uh, Jalaluddin Akbar. What did he tell his prime minister? Please personally supervise within a time frame the translation of Mahabharat into Persian. He said, because I want to know what are the traditions of this country. So these questions never cropped up. What language did Rajda Man Singh use when he was a senior dignitary of the uh, Mughal state of the day. So language is nothing to do with faith. I mean, I speak English, it doesn't mean I'm an uh, Englishman or a Christian. Somebody else speaks Arabic, it doesn't uh, identify him with a particular uh, faith. 
So language is language of the people. Why it is the language of people is a matter of uh, historical investigation. Why did X speak this language and Y sp spoke another language? You know, you moment you try to squeeze the circle, you're in trouble. And in this land of ours, you're in big trouble. How do you tell a person in uh, Tamil Nadu that you will only express yourself in Hindi? No, we've had enough trouble there. But if uh, squeezing the circle creates political dividends... Look, I will not go into political dividends. That is part of the political game. Okay? And uh, every player is entitled to uh, see it and uh, follow it according to his or her perception. I am talking of the Indian cultural perspective. The cultural perspective is that everything... You know, there was a great poet in uh, Allahabad called Firak Gurakhpuri. Raghupati Rai Firak Gorakhpuri, well known to people who studied in Allahabad University in an earlier generation. He said it all in one couplet. Can I say it in Urdu? Yes, absolutely. Sar zameen e hind par aqwaam e alam ke firak karwaan aate gaye hindostan basta kya on the land of India caravans of the world came and people came and India got established. So India has never been, you know, a closed society. Whoever has come here has been welcomed here and has become a part of uh, India. Well, I don't know, I'm not an anthropologist. Who were the first people in India? Is it important who were the first people in India? It's not. The theory about uh, whether the Aryans came from here or Aryans came from there. Why is there so much similarity between uh, uh, the linguistic ancient uh, Sanskrit and ancient Iranian languages? Did people came come from there to India or from India they went to Iran? We don't know. I mean, these are all matters of uh, academic uh, study and academic uh, speculation. But... There are no hard boundaries. There are no hard boundaries. So basically you are saying that the current developments are not in the spirit and the vision of the constitution made by the founding fathers. No, it is not. It is not. It is short-sighted and it is harmful. So before I, uh, before I close in my interview, there are a couple of questions I need to ask. So if you ever get an invitation from Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the way Pranab Mukherjee got it, Will you go there? Look, I don't address hypothetical questions. I don't address hypothetical questions. Okay. And sir, in the book, the opening, you said, Baz mein raas ki baat kahe di. Bari baz mein raas ki baat kahe di. When it happened and unfolded before you, did you feel it was a departure? How do I... I don't have a time machine to go back, do I? I was in the chair, but what is chair in the... said in the house is then not to be divided outside. You think it's a... Uh, it's a matter which should be put to rest, but you have addressed it. I have addressed it because I was only articulating on that occasion what I had said on previous occasions in my speeches and all those speeches are all on record. And it was not only the last speech, it was not only the last interview. These are facts of life. You have to see it and recognize it. If there is an ailment in my body, then I register it. That's all. Because I asked this in the context because when he said... Uh, when, when the Prime Minister said that you will be a free man after this and you will be able to make your opinions in public discourse much more freely and, uh, and he said it has a context also. It is, you say the context is what was not 
reflective of the totality. I was a professional diplomat for 40 years, longer than the normal period of most of my colleagues. I was in the service of the state and I have been all over the world. You see, the fact that every diplomat is given a language to begin with and therefore you spend a good part of your time in that language zone is what took me to uh, West Asia. But I was also India's High Commissioner to Australia and above all I was Ambassador to United Nations at a very critical time. 1993-94 were very critical times for us in the assemblies of the world. We were under pressure. We resisted that pressure. I had the privilege of being member of the delegation which Mr. Narsimha Rao in his wisdom sent under the leadership of Vajpayee. We fought off the pressure. So there's, I mean you address these things as professionals. You don't address them because of the language I speak, the faith I follow or the kind of food I eat. It was a professional job, it was done professionally, whether here, there, anywhere else. A competent officer of the Indian Foreign Service is competent to address his concerns and his uh, government's concerns in any part of the world. I was part of that fraternity, I am very proud of having been a part of that fraternity. So thank you for making time for me. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good to see you. Thank you.